Hello and welcome to the City of Cedar Falls Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for Wednesday, June 14th of 2023. I call the meeting to order. Can we get a roll call, please? Albert Husky. Here. Chrisman. Here. Grebovich. Hartley. Here. Larson. Leeper. Here. Lynch. Moser. Here. Stalnaker. Here. All right, thank you. We have a quorum. Um, first agenda item is approval of minutes. Any questions, comments, or a motion on that? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Uh, that passes. Uh, next on the agenda item is public comments. And this is for the public to get up and speak to any, uh, any item that is not on the agenda, because you'll have time to speak on anything on the agenda later. But if there is any other thing that uh, the public would like to speak on, this is your time. And I do not see anyone. So we will close public comments and move on to old business. Um, old business is a zoning code text amendment, uh, parking for institutional uses in character districts downtown. And who will be speaking for this? I'll, I'll take that one. Okay, thank you, Karen. All right. So I gave a presentation at your last meeting and you set a public hearing for tonight. So I'll just briefly summarize um, what we went over last time. And just reminding that we did talk about um, the height standards and looking at the minimum height standards in the downtown, but the commission gave direction at the last meeting that you wanted a little bit more work on what, how we might approach that. So staff will take some more time on that one. So tonight we're just talking about the parking for civic and institutional uses in the downtown character district. To go over the background, we did receive an inquiry about this from St. Patrick's about using um, a vacant lot for a surface parking lot and that property is located in the urban general uh, frontage of the downtown character district. Um, in the future, they, the church indi indicated they may um, build a new daycare building or some other building associated with the church or the school in that location. So the issue is that accessory uses such as parking are, are not allowed without a principal use generally. Um, and also parking setbacks are, uh, are in most of the zones in the city are then relative to where the principal building is on the site. So the question really is, should parking for civic and institutional uses be treated differently? So just a brief analysis here, the urban general uh, subdistrict uh, of the downtown character district encourages buildings that are close to the street with parking located behind to create a pedestrian friendly mixed use district. So parking in this area is, set, is required to be set back about 30 feet from the street. Allowance for additional area along the side streets if it is behind a building or uh, in a garage or um, a parking facility. So um, this is just an illustration on the screen here of the downtown regulating plan. And the blue line indicates the parking setback line. So, Parking can be located anywhere in this particular block. I, I just picked a random block downtown. Um, the blue line, the parking can be located anywhere behind that line. So just to give some comparison, parking setbacks in other zoning districts in the city, in our residential districts, no parking is allowed in the front yard or the front yard setback. And that's relative then to the principal house on the lot. So these are some setbacks um, required then in our residential districts, 30 feet, 25 feet, 20 feet, depending on the zone. In our mixed use zone, um, that parking setback line is about 20 to 30 feet. Uh, in the high white commercial zone, it's 20 feet. In regular commercial or manufacturing zones, it's five feet, but it's 10 feet when it's abutting a residential district. So the question here this evening is, should there be some additional flexibility for parking for civic and institutional uses in the downtown character districts? Um, we note that a number of churches and schools are located in the downtown character district and have campus-like settings, often on multiple properties. Institutional uses are important to the character of our downtown neighborhoods um, and may warrant different rules, but we also recognize that it's important to ensure that surrounding development is also respected. Um, buffer par buffering par parking areas from public sidewalks and adjacent properties will help to do that. 
So in a discussion of solutions at the last meeting, we talked about how we could provide some flexibility in the zoning ordinance by creating an amendment um, for civic and institutional uses, um, and then having some standards in the co code for how that would be allowed. So this is what staff had suggested, parking directly at butts or across the street or alley from the civic or institutional use. In other words, it's part of kind of a campus that's already been established. Um, and there'd be a, a minimum 10 foot setback from any street side lot line. So there'd be a setback of the parking from, from the sidewalk. The parking area uh, would need to be landscape according to the standards in our parking section of the code. This is the same standards that would apply to any parking lot in the city. And if the sh lot shares a common lot line with a, a smaller or a less, uh, uh, a more restrictive district like the neighborhood small or neighborhood medium frontage, those are more residential in character or a lot in our R1 or R2 districts, the parking lot would then be set back a minimum of five feet from that common lot line. So there's a bit of a buffer there and then screened. Um, this is also a common treatment in a lot of our other zones as well. Uh, when a principal building is constructed on the site, then the building will need to meet all the standards and requirements as applicable in that particular location. So these are the suggestions that staff made at, uh, at your last meeting, and this is uh, open for discussion about the com with the commission. Uh, staff recommends to allow more flexibility uh, for these types of uses. Uh, recommends this uh, an approach like this um, with any other additional conditions recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, is there any questions for staff? Any additional questions? Uh, is there uh, any uh, public input on this item? Thank you. Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, my name is Paul DeMarco. Um, I'm a longtime parishioner of St. Patrick's Parish. I live in Waverly, 1707 East Bremer Avenue in Waverly. Previously, I was a 27 year uh, resident of Cedar Falls, so still very connected to the community. Um, as I said, a longtime parishioner at St. Patrick's, I've uh, been part of the parish since the early 90s, and I've been involved with various committees and boards within the parish over the years. Um, uh, been involved with two large projects that the parish has put on uh, in the past. Uh, most recently in 2014 when we put an addition onto the parish, uh, front, front of the church and remodeling of the church, and then some renovations that we put into the school. And so we thank the, the city for the, the help and, and guidance in that. And then also in the, in the late 90s, uh, we put on the addition to the parish offices and the gymnasium uh, at, the, at the St. Patrick's building and was involved uh, as a parishioner in that process as well. So. Um, St. Patrick's has a long-standing uh, working relationship with, with all city boards and, and commissions. I'd um, like to thank the city and the staff for partnering and working with our parish committees on these successful projects. Each has had an amazingly positive impact on our parish and our, and our members and the whole community. I'm here to ask this Planning and Zoning Commission to consider support for the proposed zoning changes of the property directly north of the church and east of the school, as Karen had just outlined. We, uh, the St. Patrick's Parish, uh, have been in this community since 1854, and we've continued to look forward to the future. As a matter of fact, we have a capital campaign going on right now that is titled Foundations for Our Future, and that lot that, uh, that we've acquired is, is part of that ongoing process, and, and we look forward to the future. We consider this property as a connecting piece of our campus, an extension of the foundation between the church and the school, and I think Karen said it best, and it's, and it's noted in, in the notes, it's just part of our campus uh, that, that we want to continue using and, and working with. Uh, the current code is seemingly prohibitive to the building, uh, to the buildability of this lot. Uh, we, we'd like some consideration on that. The proposed modifications to the code would provide flexibility with that, with, and with that we might be able to do um, a lot for our parish and our community. Initial concepts have been discussed with our leadership, including the addition of parking and even a possible structure. Uh, daycare, I think, was, was mentioned. These plans are not final uh, as we are exploring the feasibility of each uh, as far as what we're allowed to do with it. As mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a capital campaign to support our options. At a minimum, our long-term long plan would be to add more parking off street 
as at our busy church service times and school events, our on-site parking is problematic at times and unsafe. The additional parking provided by this property would also assist in reducing the parking needs and loads on our neighbors and also for Main Street events. Thank you seriously for your time and consideration of these requests. We ask that you take these next steps uh, with the re review process uh, with the staff and city council members. Um, and if you have any questions, we have to answer them, but thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone else from the public that would like to address this item? I see none. I will uh, bring it back to the commission for any discussion. Questions? Motion? I think it makes a lot of sense, but uh, I still kind of go back to my concern about a different set of rules for, um, for uh, civic and institutional. Um, I just don't see why it would be unfair to ask that they'd play by the same rules that uh, are imposed on the uh, private sector. Um, with some of these changes, I think, I think it would be worthy of consideration if they were blanket changes, perhaps. But uh, I'm, I'm not willing to, um, to, I guess, sacrifice the, um, the work that was done to um, create a framework for the future of downtown um, meanwhile, continuing to make some exceptions and pick, picking and choosing winners and losers, I guess, is what it kind of feels like. Yeah, I think for me, the timing of it is it's just a bit of a challenge because we've just, just updated our, our code, and this is one of the first projects coming through and we're making an exception. And uh, personally, I feel like we need to give it a little time to work. I, 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 I'm sensitive to the needs of, you know, the church and, and additional parking. And, um, you know, at the same time, it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly short period of use, you know, during the week. And it does have an impact on kind of development and the character and feel of downtown uh, in terms of limiting density. Uh, and, and to Kyle's point, setting precedent uh, in that factor as well. So it's a tough one for me, but I kind of share Kyle's concerns. I would agree with all of that. Um, I also think that, um, you know, while perhaps one location needs that additional space, I don't know that that all of the locations need that additional parking. And then if we're going to change the rules, we allow that for all of them. So, you know, for me, I, I agree I would not choose to make an exception and change the code. Well, and if the, uh, the circumstances are extenuating, there's always the, I would imagine, the avenue of a, of a variance. Is that correct? Well, anybody has the right to request a variance from the zoning ordinance, but the bar is set pretty high to show that you don't have almost any use of the property um, because of zoning rules. So it'd be kind of tough to meet a variance standard for, for something like this. But again, anybody's free to request a variance. Thank you. Karen, was this property included in the parking study that was done for downtown or is that outside of that area? Um, that's a good question. I think maybe it was outside the area that for the immediate study of the downtown. Okay. But I can certainly get you more information about that, but um, the downtown parking study was mostly immediately downtown. Any more discussion or a motion? I'm kind of... Um, in the middle here too. I, uh, I would really like to accommodate this request. Um, I'd like to accommodate everyone's request, but there are some rules and, and, and procedures that have been put into place. So it is kind of a conflict, I would say, uh, on how to vote on this, because I'd like to accommodate the request because it makes sense. But once again, setting a precedent uh, of how we move forward, it's kind of a contradiction right now. So. That's where I am too, and you know, just thinking about the fact that we haven't even allowed this new code to really 
live up to its full potential and to see really where we're at to make changes right away is concerning. But this is pretty much an up or down vote here, correct? I mean, when it goes to a motion, so. If we have a motion. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, we need to, needs to be a motion on the floor. There's not a motion on the floor right okay. now. So are we motioning for the staff recommendation that we can, or do we need to motion? So you would make the motion in the affirmative for what's been recommended or as modified by the commission if you have any other ideas on how it might be changed. Um, okay. the, yep. So you can make that motion second and then um, you does, even if you make the motion, you can vote any way that you wish. Okay, I would motion to approve the staff recommendation of allowing more flexibility for civic and institutional uses, et cetera, et cetera. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, that would, uh, any further discussion on this before we go to a roll call vote? Roll call vote, please. Albert Haskey. Aye. Chrisman? Nay. Hartley? Aye. Larson? Nay. Leeper? Nay. Moser? Nay. Stalnaker? Nay. Uh, that motion fails. I would just note for the record that it, um, prior to the meeting, I did receive an email from uh, representative from St. Patrick's Church, and they did indicate that they would like this, uh, regardless of the vote tonight, to be forwarded to the City Council for consideration. So, as with any other uh, type of code amendment or rezoning, we would honor that request. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, that finishes up old business, and uh, we move to new business. And there are two agenda items uh, for new business. Uh, and they're both for the same development, so we're, we're going to hear from staff on both of them at the same time, and then we will open it up to uh, public comment and discussion. So um, items three and four are a master plan amendment uh, for Autumn Ridge development, also a preliminary plat Autumn Ridge uh, edition, ninth and 11th editions. And I will need to recuse myself from items three and four in the agenda due to a conflict of interest. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, who has these items tonight? That would be me, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, the case uh, three and four are tied together. Uh, it's about amendment of RP master plan for autumn rich development uh, and uh, preliminary plat for the proposed ninth and eleventh edition in this subdivision. Uh, and I will be presenting this uh, together. Uh, that way you guys can weigh in. I mean, you need to weigh in separately. First, the master plan needs to be approved to be able to approve preliminary plat. But uh, there are so many uh, common elements that I would just go over entire presentation first, and then uh, we can discuss any questions you may have. So thank you. So location, uh, here's the location map. Uh, this is uh, Autumn Ridge Subdivision, 105 acres. Uh, it, it is west of Union and south of uh, West 4th Street. Uh, this is where it's located. There is a bit of history to this development. Uh, the ongoing de uh, this is an ongoing development since 2001. Uh, wherein an RP, uh, the a entire 105 acre was rezoned to RP from A1. And this was uh, on your screen, you can see the master plan that was developed then, uh, which was having variety of type of units as indicated on the plan, uh, and including uh, a, a lake with a trail uh, in the center, which would also be a stormwater area for the site. So this is the master plan. I'm not going into details, uh, but this is the overview. Uh, more details were mentioned in the staff report for your reference. Uh, and at two th in, sorry, in 2001, they also had a development agreement uh, along with this master plan that was approved. Uh, and as part of RP zoning, uh, development, plan, development agreement is required as well as master plan amendment is required uh, to have any sort of planned uh, development in that area. So it's uh, RP zoning requirement 
which they met at that time. Uh, then this was the 2005 and six. There were uh, Autumn Bridge uh, changes to second, third, and fourth edition, as highlighted on your screen. Uh, at this time, uh, I believe it was 2006, they had another amendment to the RP uh, master plan uh, to include a daycare center. Uh, I think it's in Autumn Bridge 4th edition. And uh, at that time, the development procedure agreements were also updated. Uh, following that, there have been a preliminary plat in 2013 that laid out probably rest of the developed areas, uh, which includes a uh, plat for 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th edition. Uh, at that time, uh, there were about 58 lots proposed in 8th and 9th edition, as you can see on your screen to the right, uh, which today is being proposed uh, for 9th and 11th. Uh, but the staff wants to make a note that uh, an RP master plan was not updated when it was done, and uh, so were the development agreement not updated at that point. Uh, so now, uh, this is what the subdivision looks like today. I think uh, I've color-coded the diagram for easy understanding. Uh, so most of the development is built out. This is the last remaining piece, uh, which is the 9th and 11th, <coughs> which is the the top north section. Uh, currently, the Autumn Ridge 10th edition is in construction phase, uh, but the rest of the development is built out. Uh, this is the proposed uh, revised master plan, uh, which is uh, being proposed at this moment. Uh, they are proposing uh, 90 lots, uh, which includes uh, 44 single family units and uh, 46 bi attached units. Uh, the, the single family units um, are labeled in blue, and the pink is the bi attached units. And there is a uh, park space being proposed in the southeast corner. Uh, just some background so there will be two phases to this development one would be the ninth edition, and the phase two would be the 11th edition. Uh, in the ninth edition, the developer is proposing uh, 29 lots, which will include 15 single family and 14 bi attached units. Uh, and then in the 11th edition, that would be 61 lots, which would be the west side, uh, which will have 29 single family lots and 32 sing uh, bi attached units. Uh, the total lots are 90, uh, as mentioned. Uh, there is this increase in density, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, in 2013 when the preliminary plat for this area was done, it was 58 single family units, uh, but staff notes uh, that the proposed uh, density is uh, very well connected with street patterns, uh, which I'll be going down uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, the developer is proposing variety of housing types, which would be meeting the housing needs in the community. Uh, so this is more like a uh, area uh, highlighted where the single family units and the bi attached units are proposed. I would like to make a note that uh, detached single family uh, area is, base, uh, is about 6,000 square feet. That's like a minimum <coughs> lot size uh, required in this zone. And bi attached units uh, has minimum requirement of 4,000 square feet. Uh, the bi attached units proposed here ranges from 5,800 square feet to 12,000 square feet, and the single family uh, units ranges from 6,600 to 12,700 uh, square feet. So those are the ranges of lot areas that are being proposed in this subdivision, and all, all lots basically meets the code that we have. Uh, in addition to it, they're also proposing a park space, which would be about 1.15 1 1 acres, uh, as noted on the plan. Uh, there were some concerns uh, about uh, accessing excessive paving along the street frontage, uh, which, which added congestion on streets, uh, provided less uh, parking on street. Uh, compromised on walkability uh, in the neighborhood, and also uh, about front yards being largely paved in in instead of landscaped. Uh, so those were some of the concerns. Uh, in, in response to it, developer is proposing that the driveway width for all the lots will be limited to 18 feet on the property line or the front property line. 
and developer is also proposing that the lots with less than 60 feet would be limited to two car garages. Uh, so those those are some of the things that is uh, proposed by the developer in response to the concern. Uh, the the second uh, part was about the sidewalk connections. Uh, so developer as part of this plan would be adding sidewalks along West Union and sorry West First and Union Road uh, as highlighted uh, by red color on the screen. Uh, so the one along Union Road would be added in the phase one and uh, the West First would be added in phase two. There is a missing piece that the city uh, has noticed. There's a missing piece of sidewalk along Union that is from that is highlighted in blue. Uh, that basically is from between Paddington Drive and southern edge of the proposed subdivision. Uh, city has agreed that this would be constructed with a, a CIP project, uh, and I think it is it may be likely to start uh, in the next uh, year or so. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, was the community space, uh, shared usab usable open space for this development. So the as per RP subdivision uh, and the RP development agreement that was approved back in 2001, uh, usable open space uh, should have been provided to meet the needs of the neighborhood. City staff recommends that some usable open space is provided in this 9th and 11th, which would be the last additions in this whole development as originally agreed. Uh, in response, developer is proposing uh, 1.15 acres uh, of uh, park space in the southeast corner of this proposed area. And then staff notes that the green space will need to be carefully graded and seeded to provide uh, usable park space for the uh, future, ten uh, future residents. Uh, with that, uh, this there are, I believe there were some concerns about stormwater uh, by the neighboring residents uh, and I have a s engineer here who can explain more better than myself so I'll hand it over to him one second commission um, my name is Matt Tolan with the Cedar Falls engineering division um, just a little bit of history on this um, subdivision and uh, the larger division as a whole uh, back in 2012 um, with Autumn Ridge 5th edition, a regional detention facility was established utilizing the city's Union Road culvert. Um, the detention volumes meet the current, uh, at the time and current detention requirements, which is to detain the 100 year event, release it at a two year rate, and then also account for water quality. Um, within Autumn Ridge 9th and 11th editions, the storm sewer capacity um, we'll hold the 10-year event, which is what we require, and then anything beyond the 10-year event, we'll utilize um, overland drainage routes and swales uh, to get to the detention facility. Um, next slide. So let's let's just Matt, could oh. you just explain a little bit what's on the slide here? Because I think the illustration is helpful. If you go back to the previous slide, the yep. purple area is the detention the regional detention area, correct? And then there's arrows showing how the water would flow um, toward that that detention facility, correct? Correct, so the detention facility is located actually outside of 9th and 11th edition. It was tracted and platted with the 5th edition um, and it was designed with this utilized to the north to be incorporated and built out. Um, Looking at kind of a larger picture, zooming out a little bit, um, the green shaded area is the detention facility to the north. Um, the field to the north is what we are currently talking about. That would be 9th and 11th edition. To the south is 5th edition um, when those modifications were made. Um, the drainage pattern through this area does come from the west through the farm field into this drainage swale. Um, and then underneath through under Union Road through the, our culvert system and then into uh, the Fieldstone Edition and then onward to the north northeast towards Cedar River. Here's a picture of uh, the drainage way. Uh, so it was taken by Maria Perez, our stormwater specialist. Um, kind of in the um, lower part of the picture, you can see the head wall that was constructed. Um, that is the control device 
uh, that was installed on top of the city's culvert to monitor the flow there. And then the greenway up through there is the detention basin. Um, the developer has gone through and cleared out, um, cleared and grub through there, removed the trees um, over the winter months. And um, currently that is the basin today. So just backing up just a moment, because we get into terms that maybe engineers and planners understand, but maybe the general public does not, um, is, uh, is familiar with this. But when you talk about the control structure, Matt, so the idea here is the basin fills up like a bathtub when there's a big storm, correct? And then it releases at a certain rate. And this, con this control structure then um, keeps that water releasing at the same rate um, all the time. So there shouldn't be any additional increase in the rate of flow that flows through this culvert into the next development um, because this facility would control that and release it at the same rate. Correct. Uh, another concern that was brought to light was the um, traffic and proposed traffic with connections. Um, CGA, the Claps Auto Garber, who is the engineer of record for the developer, hired um, another engineering uh, firm, Kimberly Rouse. Um, she did a traffic impact study for the development in conjunction with the city and for the DOT approval. Um, she generated a study looking at uh, the connections both onto Highway 57, which we know is First Street, and also onto Union Road. Um, the analysis looked at trip generation generated by the subdivision um, along with if turn lanes were warranted or any improvements were needed. Um, and the DOT had a chance to review it along with us. Um, the intersections that are proposed would operate a level service A uh, and no turnout turn lanes would be warranted. Um, and then on top of that, just how the development gets built out with ninth edition, ninth edition connecting to Union Road um, at 29 lots, that was capped due to uh, fire apparatus code, um, not exceeding 30 units. So the developers met that requirement. And then the second access point on Highway 57 uh, would be made, uh, allowing for that requirement to be waived. And then two access points would be fully open after the completion of 11th. Um, the DOT has confirmed that they are accepting of the connection onto Highway 57. <coughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, so these are some of the outstanding issues that we have. Uh, one is the development ag procedure agreement that needs to be uh, revised in order to make it consistent with the RP plan. And uh, the draft ag agreement uh, and the deed uh, of the proposed 9th and 11th uh, will be finalized once we get any directions and decision from Planning and Zoning Commission. So those are some of the outstanding things. Uh, and then uh, this master plan amendment is just for discussion purpose and getting public comments. Uh, staff recommends continuing this discussion at the next planning and zoning meeting. Uh, I would also start the preliminary plat presentation because it just ties into this. Uh, so you are already aware about the history, uh, but I'll, let's just jump into what the proposed uh, preliminary plat of the proposed 9th and 11th looks like. Uh, so as we all know, uh, this is going to be phased in two parts, 9th and 11th. Uh, 9th would be 29 lots, and uh, phase 2 would be 61 lots. Uh, the subdivision uh, will be uh, having a street connection. So the phase 1 would be starting from uh, with Union Road. Uh, and then uh, we'll also have one connection uh, on West 1st or Highway 57. Uh, Apart from it, uh, there are street stops that will be provided, two along the west, which are the purple arrows to the west, uh, and then one to the north. Uh, this stub, these stubs are provided in order to uh, make sure that the future development on the abutting lots can be continued in the same pattern. Uh, provide that way, everyone has a street connectivity. Uh, so those are provided by the developer. Uh, mailbox locations, there will be three locations. Uh, one will be in phase one and two will be in phase two. Uh, apart from it, uh, RP zone requires a perimeter setback, uh, which is about 30 feet. 
which will be uh, along all those red lines marked. Uh, some of the information uh, needs to be updated on plat, which will be uh, as part of minor corrections. But this will be the 30 feet perimeter setback. Uh, the developer is proposing 20 feet front yard setback. Side yard setback is five feet for all lots. And the rear yard setback would be 30 feet for all lots. Uh, staff notes that some of the single family, or I would say, the single family lots along Aronia Drive, uh, which is the north south area, uh, will have shallower depth and will be will have some limited usable rear yard space because of the easements and setbacks. Uh, and again, as mentioned, all lots meet the zoning code uh, requirements. Uh, they are all minimum uh, areas. It, it does meet all minimum requirement uh, of lot width and lot area. Uh, and that's that's our that's the note I wanted to make. Uh, other than that, there will be easements. Uh, there will be a drainage and utility easement almost in entire periphery, which is going to be uh, 20 feet. And there will be a 35 feet drainage uh, e and utility easement along the West First uh, Street. Uh, apart from it, there are storm and drainage easements uh, in the middle section there, highlighted in purple. And then there's also a 20 feet sanitary sewer easement, uh, which will be along one of the edge of the park, western edge of the park. Uh, about community shared open space, uh, developer is proposing 1.15 acre of park space uh, as highlighted, which will be in phase one. Uh, out, out lot one, uh, which uh, slopes towards the drainage way to the south in order to create a relatively level usable park space, the area must be graded and seeded according to city standards. Uh, so uh, in in other uh, in addition to that, uh, there will be requirement about public sidewalks, uh, which we discussed. So um, public sidewalk along Union Road, uh, west of Union Road, will be added as part in, in phase one. Uh, the developer is also proposing a connection to the park from that sidewalk, uh, as in, as highlighted on the map, which will be done as in the phase one as well. And uh, there is an ADA connection to the other side uh, on the road on the sh on the channel drive that also will be done as part of phase one. Uh, the phase two sidewalk, which would be along the West First Street, would be done in phase two. Uh, but staff wants to make sure that those uh, connections, uh, the sidewalks, are done as required. That way, the city can start the next process of that missing sidewalk, which is the su su just south of this proposed subdivision. Uh, and that way, people have uh, pedestrian access to the new park as well as the subdivision. Just one other thing to note, in any subdivision, sidewalks are required at the time of development then. So the sidewalks that JD mentioned are the ones that the developer would put in at the time when they're constructing the streets. And then as houses are built, that's when the sidewalks go in for each individual lot. Um, that way, the um, builders are not driving over public sidewalks while they're building each house. So it's a little bit different for the, for the local streets, and, and those sidewalks are required. Uh, uh, thank you, Karen. We went to, uh, in, uh, we discussed the stormwater management on site, but there are some other aspects uh, that will be discussed by Matt. I think that would also provide some clarity to some of the questions that were raised. Thank you, JD. Um, so in conversations, um, it's come up recently, just stormwater maintenance and repair um, the city with all stormwater detention facilities requires uh, an agreement between uh, the uh, pending association and the detention practice to maintain um, an ongoing practice with um, annual maintenance, um, some initial upfront maintenance. Uh, in this area, the regional facility constructed with 5th edition is maintained by the Autumn Ridge Stormwater Drainage Association. Um, between the association, the developer, um, and all the benefit properties that are outlined in that agreement, um, the recorded agreement, are there to uh, make sure the basin's maintained and ongoing. Um, in discussion with CGA, with this updated proposal for 9th and 11th edition, uh, they did verify the capacities 
uh, that the basin can hold, uh, what is projected for build out in 9th and 11th edition. Um, the agreement is ongoing and it's actually this 9th and 11th edition is already incorporated in that agreement. Um, so those that will live in this edition will join that st stormwater drainage association uh, for the continued maintenance of that basin. Um, another thing we want to talk about um, outside of the control of stormwater, I uh, just want to talk about stormwater pollution prevention um, at any time during construction. Um, contractors required to obtain a SWIP, a stormwater pollution prevention plan, um, both um, at the state level with a general permit number two and at the city with a stormwater uh, permit. Uh, for developments, those usually follow in two categories. Um, prior to the construction of the development, the developer will submit a development SWIP permit, which encompasses the entire buildable area of the planned addition. Um, the city will go out and inspect prior to construction, and once that's approved, construction can begin. From there, uh, there's weekly inspection of controls. Um, that would be like silt fence, uh, stabilized construction entrance, seating, um, and then the permit will remain open uh, with the general permit number two until there's 70% site stabilization. Um, once the development has been built and we're in um, constructing houses, there's an additional permit that's required uh, for a site or parcel. Uh, it follows similar to the development permit, but it's on a smaller scale per lot um, in which the individual house builder will pull a SWIP permit, um, just like the larger developments inspected weekly um, and inspected prior to construction. Um, and the individual sites have their individual controls, including silt fence, stabilized entrance. Um, and then once it's done, it needs to be stabilized with seating. Same with those, they also do require another 70% um, of stabilization in order to close it out. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Uh, as mentioned, they, uh, we do have a rough draft of the deed of dedication for this proposed preliminary plat, and uh, the wording of the document will be dependent on the conditions and specifications uh, as recommended by Planning and Zoning Commission. And there are some minor uh, label corrections on the plat that needs to be done, but those are some of the technical issues that is ongoing uh, with this proposal. Uh, with that, uh, I would also like to make a note uh, for public uh, that this Autumn Ridge uh, amendment to this master plan uh, was uh, earlier brought up in 2020. I don't know how many of you were here back then, but they brought up uh, for the proposed 9th and 11th edition. Uh, that that time, the proposal was uh, 95 lots, uh, which included 35 single family and 60 bi-attached units. Uh, and then there were several concerns discussed at Planning and Zoning Commission and concerns brought in by neighbor, uh, after which uh, another plan was proposed by the developer in 2022, uh, wherein there were 92 lots proposed for the same area, uh, which included 34 single family and 58 bi-attached units and a park space. Uh, and then at that meeting, there were several concerns that were brought up by the neighbors, as well as some of the comments by Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, now, uh, after addressing some of those, uh, developer is proposing this new plan uh, with 90 lots, which will be 44 single family and 46 biotash units. Uh, I did provide like detailed summary of what happened or what issues were discussed in 2020, 2022 in the staff report. And I've also included the minutes from those uh, meetings for your reference. Uh, but I just want to make a note of that before <laughs> I hand this over. And so again, this is preliminary plat is just for discussion and comment only. We want to note that a uh, proposed preliminary plat cannot be approved prior to the approval of RP master plan and the development agreement. Uh, so this is just for uh, initial discussion and staff recommends continuing the discussion to the next meeting uh, and any, any, any comments by Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, and with that, uh, we also have an applicant here. Uh, I'm available for any questions, uh, uh, but that's it, thank you. 
Thank you, JD and Matt and Karen for the descriptive presentation. Um, is the, uh, well, is the, is there um, any questions for staff from the commission? I just have one. Can you tell me when that traffic study was done, that updated one that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, it was done with the last uh, submittal, so it would have been uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, so, there, or maybe a clarification, I guess. Um, the preliminary plat that's being proposed, is there still revisions to that that we're expecting before it's ready to vote on for approval? Or would our approval um, go along with the recommended uh, updates or changes before it went to council for approval of the preliminary plat? So, uh, so uh, for this case, uh, we need to vote or approve the master plan first, and then we can vote on primary plat later because master plan needs to be approved first in order to approve those plats. Right, I understand that part. I'm just okay. asking about the, the plat. If the plat is to a point where preliminary is ready to approve, or are we expecting that at the next meeting based on follow-up from this meeting, or what's the sort of status? So it really kind of depends on if there are modifications that the commission has questions about based on public input tonight, if there's additional changes, or if you, you know, uh, so really it's about the input from the community and from the commission at this point, and then any anything that happens tonight can then be incorporated into changes in both the master plan and and the plat if necessary. So we don't know yet whether you know. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Um, was the fieldstone retention basin was that? Um, when that was put in, was that with the anticipation that this area would become developed? Was that in its planning when it was built or was that as things have developed? I think there would always be an expectation that the community grows. Um, so every development is responsible for managing the stormwater. And uh, of course, this is a stream corridor, so the water is going to flow in this direction toward Fieldstone. Um, that's why I mentioned that control structure that Matt described. It controls the water and the rate that it goes toward Fieldstone. And then, of course, Fieldstone would also have the responsibility for maintaining their stormwater facility over time. Um, and anytime you're damming up, of course, a creek, you're going to have some issues with ponds silting in. So. That's just a natural thing that's going to occur and every subdivision that has such a facility would, would be expected to have to maintain that over time. I'm glad that came up. That, uh, that was the other question I had. That, uh, um, that control device that was added to the, uh, um, to the regional basin, when was that improvement done? 2012. Okay. So that, that would have been done around the same time as fifth phase, is that correct? It was constructed with fifth edition. Okay, all at the same time. Okay, I, didn't, I, I was just wondering if that was something that was newly added in the meantime to address uh, down, downline concerns or whatever. So they would have had to show when they did the fifth edition with this regional stormwater management plan how they weren't gonna release water at any greater rate than what it had been done before pre-development. Is that correct, Matt? Correct. So that would have been re required at the time of that platting and that regional stormwater management. So that's why it was done at that time. Okay, so would it be correct to assume then that, uh, um, that limiting um, downstream water into the Fieldstone area would have been, um, those measures would have been taken in 2012? And, um, and then also that any improvements being done now is not necessarily interjecting any new water. Um, it's all the same water that has been being dealt with down the line, right? So when they constructed this back in fifth edition, it was designed with an intent that the area to the north was gonna be incorporated and developed as well. Um, so it was all designed for that. Uh, but you're correct, it, it is a metered release of a two-year event. 
Um, so anything that doesn't or exceeds a two-year event would detain behind the structure and not inundate the downstream pond. So there theoretically would be no change to the downstream conditions? Correct. Okay. Matt, Thank could you. you. Could you speak to the, and this, we've had a couple of issues with like silt in these, in these kind of structures in the past. The structures that you're talking about are largely about controlling water, correct? What, what is the, are there mechanisms and requirements that control the kind of silt buildup over time in these or not really? Um, I guess just speaking to it at a at kind of a higher level, um, as Karen was mentioning, as you start to kind of block off sections of a stream or a natural waterway, um, it's causing the water velocity to slow down and lose, you know, whatever is the, the water was carrying. So you have kind of this natural siltation um, event. Um, as far as maintenance goes, um, in the maintenance repair agreements, there are uh, different limits of when the siltation does get removed um, and how it gets removed. Um, so that's kind of the big picture. It's kind of built into the agreements. For maintenance, yeah. It is, it's just an ongoing maintenance. Is there a formal inspection regimen for anything like that? Yep, and it's outlined in the agreement. Okay. How will, you talk quite a bit about the, um, the green space and how there, there will need to be a lot of grading to make it usable. How will that impact all of this movement of water? So there's no planned construction in the basin. Everything would be outside of the basin uh, to the north. Um, with the regrading, um, maybe just more on the swip side of things, um, you know, controls would have to be placed along the waterway and then um, secondary controls around stockpiles. Um, so those would be protected against the waterway during construction. Um, and then towards the final development, um, you know, the agricultural field would be switched more to a permanent lawn status. Um, so seeding would take place and we would start to see um, the, the seed matrix, if you will, with the density of seeding increase and um, in theory, just lock that topsoil layer down so we don't get the erosion or rilling. And that outlet, outlot one, is that, uh, is that dedicated to the city or to the parks division, or is that retained as green space within the, um, I would imagine, ownership of the HOA as common area of sorts? The intent was this, this would be dedicated to the city for a public park. So the city, once the city is satisfied with how it's been graded and seeded and um, uh, we would then accept it as uh, part of the city's park system. Okay. Are there are minimum requirements for those for those parks. I mean, it, I look at the preliminary master plan, and there's quite an extensive kind of park, and it feels like this is pretty much the absolute minimum. Um, I did just give a presentation to the city council uh, a, couple, a week or so ago about the requirements in the subdivision code for open space. The subdivision code is rather vague about the amount. Um, uh, it just says that it shall provide for the needs of, of, the, of the neighborhood. Um, so we have seen, I think, over time, and, and many of you sit on this, and I believe Mr. Stelnaker is on the Parks and Rec Commission, as well as the, now on the Planning and Zoning Commission, so he might have some knowledge about this as well. But thinking about neighborhood-sized parks, you know, between one and five acre parks, um, Green Hill Village has um, a five acre park there. Uh, um, West Fork, which is more recent subdivision, there's a two acre park proposed in that development. Um, I think Pinnacle Prairie, which is a really large development, has a number of different spaces that are um, in the master plan set aside for parkland and trails. So it really is a judgment call on whether this, this is a, the right size for this development. Just on my quick search, it looks like it's the same exact size as the Clay Street Park, for reference. Yeah. I wonder about, so we got in our many emails that we received, which I'm sure some of you are here, so thank you very much for those. Um, lots of stormwater related questions um, and obviously you guys have answered some of those. I wonder if 
Maria Perez could provide any additional insight for us, um, maybe at our next meeting. I know she has some really great visuals for understanding stormwater and how it moves and silt and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that would just help us and the public to better understand the oversight or understanding of those things. We can certainly yeah. ask her to attend the next meeting. Any more questions for staff? Nope. Okay. So, uh, is the uh, applicant here tonight and want to speak to this? <coughs> Name and address for the record, please. Good evening. I'm Dennis Happel with BNKD from Waverly. Uh, thank you for considering our <coughs> proposal this evening. Um, we have... Uh, we're submitting the new master plan and the preliminary plat based on the recommendations from the city staff and the comments from PNZ in the past meetings. Every phase of our development has gone through city staff, PNZ, and council. There have been no shortcuts whatsoever. I know there's a question on the uh, master plan and why some of that wasn't taken care of. We have submitted everything that we were required to do at the time. Um, the major items I think that uh, have been touched on, um, the traffic, obviously we had the study, um, which is required. We did what was uh, required of us. Uh, the density, I'll speak to that just briefly. Uh, in 2001, the master plan showed uh, we were going to install 479 units. And that over the five, excuse me, 105 acres, that's 4.6 units per acre. After fully developed with this new phase, uh, we will have 375 units or 3.6 units per acre for the entire development. The 22 acres that we are proposing right now will have a density of four units per acre. We meet all of the requirements for the RP zoning. Um, in fact, we exceed most of them. Um, the other item I, I think has a little bit of uh, misconception is on the stormwater. We are required to maintain our 105 acres for, as Matt explained, um, the 100 year event or, or whatever the formula is. That is what we are responsible for maintaining and, and constructing for. There's approximately 100 acres to the west of us that we do not account for and are not required to account for that. So if we have a four inch rain, all that water from that 100 acres, we aren't required to corral that and, and make it uh, pure again or whatever you wanna call it. So I, I just wanna make sure that there aren't any misconceptions about what we are required to do and what happens on site. Um, city staff has reviewed everything. I think everything is in compliance. Uh, obviously, we'd like to have this move forward as quickly as possible. Um, I'll take any questions that you may have uh, for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, excuse me, Matt uh, Garber with CGA is here also for the more technical questions. Okay. All right, thank you. Does the commission have any questions for the applicant right now? I believe not right now, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this would be the time for uh, the public wants to get up and speak to this agenda item. Uh, for um, the sake of efficiency, uh, we want everyone to come up and speak. Uh, and if you have questions, please list your questions, but we can't do a question and answer back and forth. So if you get up, speak, uh, and uh, let us know what you feel. And if you have questions, once you're sitting down, uh, either at the end of the session or after each question, we will see if we can formulate an answer to that question. So, is anyone from the public like to speak to this item? <laughs> and we'll need your name and address for the record. Thank you. I'm Cindy Luchtenberg. My address is 4322 West First Street. 
we're on the north and, uh, end of this development and it also runs along the west side of our property. Um, some of the things that I wanted to discuss, um, first of all, you did mention you received a lot of emails and um, we did have a lot of people who were very concerned about this whole thing. Um, unfortunately, they all couldn't come because it's summertime and a lot of people are on vacations, that type of thing. Um, I would like to state, though, that the majority of us here tonight are, we're not against having this being developed. I want to make that clear. Um, we, uh, we were fine with the idea of having neighbors. Um, I was thrilled with the idea of finally having neighbors because we live on an acreage and I you know, have to walk miles before I can get to somebody. But um, we were under the assumption that there was going to be about 57 nice homes with decent sized lots that had some green space to them um, that was proposed in 2013. It got, it got changed in 2013. And uh, the initial um, proposal we absolutely loved. It had the cul-de-sacs and it had that big retention pond with the green space around it that people could you know, enjoy. Um, we all thought it was just an absolutely beautiful um, plan. And like I said, we were thrilled with it. Well, then in 2013, it got changed and um, we weren't, you know, thrilled with it because then the um, uh, detention pond was completely taken away and the cul-de-sacs were taken away. And I understand that I think they say cul-de-sacs maybe aren't the, the best anymore due to snow removal, that type of thing. Um, but then in 2020, uh, well, in 2013, we only had, it was still all homes, and it was 57 homes that were going to be around us there. And that's just on that very north end of this uh, development. And then in um, 2020 is when it was changed. And I know Mr. Hoppel talks about the uh, amount of how homes or the amount of, um, that they were not homes, but, but uh, I forget what it was. It, that he, first it was 400, then it went down to like 300 or whatever. But you have to understand that on the south side of all this was very condensed already with a lot of um, retirement uh, homes and that type of thing. So it was condensed on that end, our end, as everybody that bought lots were told is this whole development to the north is going to um, be consistent with the types of homes that were built on the more north end of this that are the, the, with the nicer size lots, single family, um, comparable some maybe to even what's over in the Fieldstone Edition, which is our neighbor across the street. So we were okay with the 57 homes. Um, we were okay with the design. But then in 2020 it got changed and it was now almost all duplexes. Completely different than what we, you know, were told and completely different than what the homeowners that bought lots there were told. Um, and I can say that per what I was told, that they were promised that this was going to be just like the development that was already, you know, just south of them. So the other big concern with all this um, development is, of course, the water runoff um, with all the, and, and I want to read something here, first of all, and I hope I, I'm not wasting a lot of time, but I think it's important. Um, this is a, a paragraph from the brochure created by the Iowa Storm Wa Stormwater Organization, and I just want to read it quickly. It says, urban landscapes have impervious 
surfaces, including streets, parking lots, and rooftops. In addition, urban soils have a high probability of having compacted soils due to grading activities. Impervious and compacted urban landscapes prevent infiltration of rainfall and increase the amount of runoff. And this is what we were concerned about. Almost every rainfall in urban areas generates runoff that rapidly reaches streams, causing stream corridor erosion and increased flood potential. As the runoff moves across the landscape, it captures pollutants that may cause water quality problems. And I know Matt had talked about the studies that they did and that they were considering the development of the north part there when they did their study. But you have to remember that study was done with only 57 houses. It was done back in 2012, didn't you say? And that was when the original plan was about 57 houses over there, not 90. So I think that study needs to be redone because we've got double the amount of, of homes there now. So we've got more cement, we've got more driveways, we've got very narrow lots, so there's no green space for any of this water to soak into. And then we've got the roofs. I mean, there's, there's nothing there to soak up water. And that's got to run off into something. And I know that's the concern with the Fieldstone Edition as well as the Lakeview Edition. The Lakeview Edition ended up having an extremely large cost to them to finally have to fix their pond because of the waterway maintenance that was not done properly. And it ended up having this sediment over the years that there was all this construction going on into their, into their pond. And it killed half of their fish. You know, uh, they, it completely ruined that pond. So they had, I think it was, they said uh, over $145,000 that it ended up costing them to... How many? 345, excuse me, 345,000. So anyway, um, some other things that I wanted to reference, and I wrote things down so I wouldn't forget. Um, I know one of the things that, um, with, with the duplexes and that type of thing, um, we're concerned about the, the trans, I call it a transient community that ultimately seems to happen when you have, you know, those types of homes. Those types of homes, um, let me look here where I've got it so I can read it to you. The families in the area would like to see more single family homes going up versus duplexes because people tend to live in single family homes much longer. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I was thrilled with the idea of having some neighbors. Um, we want a community of neighbors that we can get to know and grow with. We do not want a transient neighborhood where people move every couple of years. And that's exactly what happens when people live in duplexes. Duplexes are not considered a permanent home by most. It's considered a first home or just a temporary home. And another uh, of our own personal fears is that these duplexes and small homes will eventually, you know, be bought by maybe, you know, who knows, and, and simply become rental properties then, um, which will open up another Pandora's box, as I say, with, with many other problems. Um, there again, there's, there's just so many things that I want to talk about, but I know I I'm, need other people to talk. Uh, another concern that I had was, you know, with, with the water retention and everything, I noticed that there was these large piles of dirt along the uh, waterway. 
And so I called and I asked about it. And, um, and then I all, we, we had a meeting um, with the neighbors. We had a, a neighborhood meeting. And uh, Brian Hoppel, who is the son of, of Mr. Hoppel, he was at the meeting. And I asked him about him. And he said, well, those are um, coming from the, uh, we're doing Paddington. And those are piles of dirt that we're, you know, putting over there. And he says, and there's going to be a lot more. I'm like, okay. So then when I called and I asked him, I says, are you putting any silt fencing or anything like that up? And he said something about some kind of grass type of, is there a grass type of fencing or silting or whatever? I, or not silting, but that would netting. I don't know. It was something he said with grass. Um, and then I mentioned to him that I was concerned with the, uh, there, were, there didn't seem to be any setbacks on any of the property lines around us. It, in the middle, there was no setbacks because those are zero lot uh, duplexes that they're going to be putting on there. And when I asked him about whether or not why there wasn't any setback on those sides, there's setback, it shows the easements on the back and the easement on the front, but it doesn't show any setbacks whatsoever on the sides, which kind of concerned me. And he told me, this, this is, and I, like I said, I have other people here who can, who can vouch for it. He said, those, you know, if I buy them, he says, I will put single family homes there. But he says, if anybody else buys it, he says, they can put duplexes there too. He says, Be and I was upset by that because it's marked as single family homes, and, but they're very, very narrow lots. And I thought, how can you put a single family house on such a tiny little lot with all the easements and everything? So that concerns me. I wanted to bring that up because are we going to have the whole thing become duplexes even though they say that they're not going to? Um, there's been too many miscommunication, if you want to call it that, from what BNKD has told people and what they're actually doing. And it's to the point where we, I'm sorry, but we can't trust them anymore. I don't know what to do but to come to you and plead with you to think about the people that already have bought their homes, who already bought lots there because of what Mr. Hopple told them. And now it's changed. Everything's changed. We, you know, I, how would you feel if that happened to you? And that's basically all we can do is say, you know, please consider who's already there and how is this decision going to affect everybody years and years from now? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Lyle Simmons, I live at 207 Corduroy in the 5th edition. Cindy's kind of a hard act to follow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the stuff that, that she brings up, I, I would certainly echo, but some of the things are a little bit more, a little bit more personal. As, as we look at it, we bought our lot from Hopples back in 2004, excuse me, 2014, and we're really excited to be there. I was in February, and, and in June, we had a basement board. As we bought our lot, we bought into the plan. We bought in the plan that this is what 5th edition is going to look like. We were told that the, the land to the north was going to be developed to look much like our neighborhood. Uh, you know, once again, 56, 58 homes, things kind of changed back and forth a little bit. We thought, you know what, that's going to be really great, um, you know, because... That was the area, that was the community that we were looking for. That's what we bought into, and that's what we invested a good portion of our savings uh, and, and built a home that we thought would be complementary to the neighborhood and to the community. And so as we move forward, uh, you know, once again looking at the 2013 plan, because that's what we were shown, um, 
we were all for it. Like Cindy said, kind of neat to get some neighbors and, and you know build that build that existing community. As we started seeing the the duplexes moving in, I said, wait a minute, this isn't this isn't what we'd signed on for, guys. Somebody's changing the rules on us, and and quite honestly, we didn't like it. And so that's one of the reasons we're making things heard. Um, I can talk about the waterway. Um, concerns there is how do we maintain it with the density that's going into the north. Uh, it looks like it's pretty much landlocked. I'm not sure how to get in there to, to fix it for Stormwater Association. Um, there's, there doesn't seem to be access there. Um, some of the things that Matt brought up, and thank you for, for the, the explanation of that, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, with the, the structure that goes under Union Road, my question is, is, are the folks in Autumn Ridge absolved from any sort of, of ramifications that could come from a torrential rain or from something else coming in? Not saying that, that, that we don't care about the gang over across Union Road, but are we absolved from that or is there somehow, do we hold a liability there? Um, you know, I know that we're not gonna answer questions now, but that's one that I have. You know, does that, does that structure and that wall, uh, is that our insurance policy? And, and how good is it? Um, you know, I would love to see things go back to the 2013 plan. I really would. Uh, I think that it would be in the care and keeping of the northwest corner of Cedar Falls and the houses that are there. I think that it would bring continuity to those neighborhoods. And I know that it would certainly be welcomed by all of this around there. That's all I got. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Name and address for the record, please. My name is Brad Piercebaker. I live at 4228 West First Street in Cedar Falls. Uh, we are, uh, my wife and I own the property directly north of the proposed addition. Um, just to echo kind of what they're saying, I'm not gonna take a lot of time, but uh, just some individual concerns. Um, when we talk about the houses and the zero lot line, um, like Cindy said, Brian had mentioned, you know, he can't control what other contractors want to come in and do if they want to build duplexes there. So it kind of, you know, where it's advertised as 46 sing single houses. Um, JD, I think you had on the slide earlier where it said side setbacks uh, was five feet or something like that. So I just want to make clear that if those are single homes, those are single standing homes and not, you know, being advertised as that, but where somebody can go in and make a duplex or anything like that. So um, that was one concern on that. Um, I think another thing, when we talked about the sidewalks, uh, they were gonna develop it, uh, part of our property, it goes clear to Union Road. Um, will we be responsible then? Because um, I think Mr. Happel said they would take the, the sidewalk up Union Road to where their property is. But then from that point on, um, we own two where the next property is. Will I be required to put a sidewalk in there? I guess that would be my, or is it just going to stop right there? Or what would that look like? Uh, and one more thing, we've talked about traffic and the water runoff, obviously a big concern, but with the new high school being built in that part of town, uh, there's going to be a lot of increased traffic, um, you know, with the intersections and things like that. Um, you know, that's gonna open up in another year, so what will that look like? And then you put 90 additional homes in there. Uh, you know, it's kind of a concern with the traffic and the safety for everybody, so. Thank you for your time. Um, Karen, thank you for, I did have a question on this street stub, but uh, Karen did a great job of explaining what it was for, and so I greatly appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public uh, wanna speak? Please come up and name an address, please. My name's Jim Hancock. I'm at 821 Lakeshore Drive. I live uh, around Lakewood Hills Lake, and that is the lake that is the last stop before the water goes to the Cedar River. Uh, we are the, Oro the Lake Association group that just spent $345,000 
to have the silt, the, the city's dirt taken out of our private lake. And that is, of course, a big swallow to, to undergo. And of course, we're very concerned about any additional dirt that's gonna continue to come in. And uh, listening to the discussion today, I'm concerned and would like maybe some clarification about We've heard that the, uh, exist, the, the structure for the detention uh, basin control will cover or take care of uh, the flow similar to what it is today, but I also hear that you know there's four inches uh, rain that comes off of the, off of the uh, land west of us and, I, and that is not considered. I hear that the uh, 57 houses is what was used for the study that, um, that, that, that measured that, and in fact, there's going to be 90. And uh, so if that analysis is done with you know, improper uh, data or, or information provided, then of course I you know, don't have a lot of confidence in what, if we're gonna be protected. Um, it, it, it's it's concerning also because uh, you can't necessarily uh, anticipate it, but when it comes, it comes. And there, it, when we have a large amount of rain, it comes right down to the right through that addition through Fieldstone into Burtzel Creek and then into our lake. And if you're wondering what that does to a area, come look at the creek beds that are associated with that path. It just rips right through the banks of the creeks that feed into our lake. And it sounds like this condition is going to make it even worse. So um, I'm, I'm wondering also, would like to know, is there a riprap plan for around this basin? Is there a riprap plan for this gully that will be uh, heavily hit with a lot of rain that some of it sounds like it's not necessarily been considered? So um, if you could you know, clarify that, I see plenty of riprap in other areas. I know there's detention bases in other areas. Why is there not detention bases with riprap as part of your study? Thank you very much. Does anyone else like to speak tonight? Name and address, please. Sure, uh, David Davis, 4407 Berry Hill Road. So what they're talking about is in my backyard. <coughs> the safety, the increased number of cars going from 92 homes versus 58, not good for anybody. Environmental impact, we've talked about the drainage. Kyle asked a question about the impact downstream. While the answer was correct, the rate at which it's released is going to be the same. There will be a higher volume because the farmland is gone and now it's covered in concrete and houses. So there will be more silt, there will be more volume going downstream and it will have an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak tonight? Name and address, please. Ann Spur, 4211 Berry Hill Road. Um, one thing, I know you talk about that that basin can hold the water. My backyard is on the basin. I have seen it fill already. It's been up to the back of our property. So it's hard to believe that it can hold all that additional without it being, I'm on the low point, so it's coming in my house next. That's a concern. Um, and then there, I have a concern about that green space because I watched that committee meeting last week when the city was talking about the concern of the green space in these neighborhoods. Um, Ryan Hopple told us at our neighborhood meeting a week ago that this is a green space, not a park. That it's not intended to be a park. It will only be a green space, but that green space is also being put along Union Road. I don't know if you guys travel Union Road, but the cars go 45 miles an hour and faster. This is, I guess, I don't have little kids at home, but I wouldn't want my kids playing in a park on a 45 mile an hour road. It's concerning that way to me, and it'd be nice to see a green space that meant something that wasn't butting up against a waterway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else like to speak tonight? Gareful. 
old and he just about did it. <laughs> so, I'm Tom Litton. I live at 918 Juanita. I'm in the uh, Lakewood Hills edition with Jim. Jim went over most of the stuff. I, I was going to say, but what I want to reiterate is the plan for maintaining the silt in the construction area once all this starts. There's additional talk to be had about the stream beds on the way down, but right now this, my question is about the plan, and I think Matt addressed that in the water retention. There was, there were issues there with controlling the silt also. Is that true? I was going to anyway. say, we, we can answer questions when Okay, well, I think it was. I just yeah. didn't quite all hear it all. And if that's so, then I think there also sh should be a, uh, an issue there if it's not done or if it doesn't work that somebody is made to pay for it because con the uh, construction company is not going to do a thing unless there's a penalty there for not doing it. And penalty doesn't mean slap your hands. It means... To me, it's money. So if you don't do it, you pay the price. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else like to speak tonight? I am not seeing anyone, so I will bring that back to commission right now. But I would like to try to answer some of these questions. Uh, hopefully we captured them all. Um, there was a question or concern about duplexes being built on additional lots, I guess it would be the way it was asked. So because this is a master plan community, the developers asked for a master plan, there could not be a change unless they came back through this commission again in the city council. So unlike um, like an R1 or an R2 zone, there are certain those zones allow both duplexes and single family and there are certain lot sizes that are required for those and you can put either one as long as you're meeting all the lot size requirements in those zones in this zone it's done by a master plan so this is the proposed master plan they could not put duplexes on lots that are, have been designated as single family without coming before you again to ask for that change okay thank you um i don't see any lawyers up here, but the liability to existing home, homeowners for uh, water downstream uh, damage. Uh, do we have a legal stance on that? I think we can just generally talk from engineering standpoint on that. Um, from a big picture um, with these drainage conveyance systems, um, the in this case, we have a series of detentions that are in um, series, if you will. Um, the point of the detention practice in a big picture, Karen kind of alluded to it, it is a bathtub example. Um, you know, you have your, you pull a tub full of water, you pull the plug off the bottom, water's metered out at a specific rate. Um, we have that throughout a series of different uh, basins going to the Cedar River Basin. Um, in this case, uh, the, the Autumn Ridge Stormwater Drainage Association, um, their responsibility is to the basins that um, are outlined in their agreement um, that have maintenance in place. In terms of liability, um, the way the agreement's set up, the city and the association are in agreement. Um, you know, in the event that there's an issue at hand, the city notifies the association of what remedies need to be taken place um, in the event that those aren't taken or it's a life or death situation in the event that um, the city needs to act in a quick manner, the city has the ability to do that and assess the cost back to the drainage association um, for those uh, remedy fixes. Um, downstream um, control of that, I mean, there is uh, with the basin in Cedar Falls citywide, uh, the detention practice is to detain the 100-year event. Um, in the event we were to exceed the 100-year event, um, the culvert would be over tops, uh, would go in there, but across the board that would happen citywide. So that would be a pretty substantial event in the fact that everybody would be having drainage issues at that point. Um, so as a city, uh, the way our code's laid out, our threshold was set up to detain um, the 100-year event. Uh, thanks. Uh, 
that explains some, but I don't know if it explains any liability responsibility to upstream owners, but I. So I think we can get a better answer for you next time, a more okay. detailed answer for you next time. But in general, every development is res responsible for their own <coughs> management of their own water. And that would include this development and Fieldstone and Lakewood. Okay. So all the developments would be responsible for their water. Okay. Um, a question for a sidewalk on First Street. To co would a property owner that has an existing property on First Street be required to add sidewalk to connect any of this new sidewalk that's coming in? So only if they were to bring a development forward for their property. Um, missing sidewalks in the community are built when property develops. So that's been there a long time without, you know, it's an acreage, doesn't have a sidewalk. Um, so they wouldn't be required to put it in unless they decided to develop their property further. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there was a question on silt and ponds and, and, and for my own education. Uh, I'm, a, I'm under the assumption that the neighborhoods downstream that have retention ponds, that those retention ponds are managed by HOAs and then the HOA is responsible for any silt removal. Is that, am I correct on that understanding? Uh, that's correct. Okay. So you, so you would think that the HOAs have those in place since they have a retention pond? Uh, yeah, they're supposed to have, I mean, that would be the responsibility of the homeowners association to make sure that they're collecting the right dues over time to maintain their facility and their pond. Okay. Um, sometimes that's hard to do. I know when people forget over time when it's there for 20 years, 20 plus years that you do have to kind of dredge it out and maintain it because it does, you've dammed up a creek. So it is going to have, it is going to get silt in it. Okay. Thank you. Matt, is it on that topic? Is it, is it accurate to say that we have water control policies in terms of storm runner? We have silt control policies during construction. There really are no silt control policies or structures, you know, anything that really kind of deals with that after, right? I mean, we had a lot of silt coming from off-site probably into this system that's just not considered at all, right? Uh, so with these basins, there is um, the newer modern basins, including this one, have a water quality to feature um, that does um, filter out the first inch and quarter of rain. Um, that comes from the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual to help with some of those um, peak flows, helps filter out some of the debris. Um, but given the soils in Iowa, um, in this area, um, siltation just does naturally happen to occur. There is a agricultural field to the west outside of jurisdictional limits um, that does flow into this basin. Um, so those that maintain this basin will just have to you know, follow their maintenance plan, evaluate if siltation has taken place and take action if it's building up. A follow-up question that's <clears throat> somewhat related is that <clears throat> we have a lot of good engineering, right, that goes into these properties. And then I, I think I heard you say we have 100 acres to the west that's completely uncontrolled and unconsidered in that system. Is that, is that accurate or not? Uh, that's not accurate, actually. Uh, when they originally designed the regional detention facility, and I can defer to CJ if they like to speak, but um, they did account for some offsite drainage, knowing that uh, the space and would have to control some of the upland um, uh, agricultural runoff that was included in their stormwater calculations. Um, I would just like also to, to add that CGA when this new plan was brought forward, did reevaluate the basin from the 2012 design and verified that the most recent design does meet this capacity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, did I cover everyone's questions? Uh, th there was a question about the site, uh, site setbacks. I okay. just want to just okay. make a note thank on you. that. So uh, the sites set back uh, for all units for single family as well as the buy attached unit is five feet. So there will be site, uh, five feet set back for all the single family units as well as the buy attached units. The central area and the area to the south where the buy attached units are uh, proposed, one of those lot line will have zero setback. That's how they will be attached. But that, that is the uh, question. Uh, th that, that is something to summarize. 
with regard to easements, uh, easements are usually in the south of the lot or north of the lot. That's a very standard practice to have easements on the front and the uh, along the front property line, along the back property line. Uh, that way, it carries the utilities or any uh, means uh, of stormwater drain needed or those kind of things. But that's a very standard practice. Uh, other setbacks in this, particularly, is a 30 feet perimeter setback. So probably all these houses will at least have 30 feet setback from all the property lines to uh, which is the exterior boundary of the subdivision. I would say that, uh, and then 30 feet is the rear yard rear setback <coughs> for all the uh, lots, despite uh, be it single family or be it by attached units. And uh, all the units will have front yard setback of 20 feet. So that is just to summarize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just I'm having trouble reconciling the the numbers that we heard about units per acre on the north development originally versus the site plan that I look at because it those two those two aren't jiving in my brain yet because it doesn't look like the same number of units per acre when I look at those plans. So can you can you explain that? Maybe the developer can explain that a little bit too. Maybe CGA has those numbers. I'm sorry, Brad. I'm not understanding your question. So when I look at the original uh, master plan, there's a pretty uh, low density kind of units per acre just visually when I look at that. And you're talking the 2001 or the 2001. Okay. And you had mentioned that the units per acre actually are lower in this proposed plan, I think, than that original plan. And that well, doesn't jive for me. For the overall density from the north end to the south end of the entire 105 acres, the density is lower so you're by one unit per spot. acre. But you also said the north um, master plan acres. also is lower, I think. No, the north 22 acres is four units per acre. Had it been at the 58, it, you know, is roughly 2.2 units per acre. And did you say I'd written down that the original 2001 was 4.6 units per acre? Is that for the whole site or is that just that the north? entire site? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, also to clarify, uh, I, I'm just bringing this up. Uh, so master plan, when this was done in 2001, they had uh, five areas on which the density was derived. You can see on that master plan. So there were areas where there were condominiums, which is area A to the left. The pink area was more of retirement facility. It had its own uh, proposal uh, about what the units would be. Uh, then there are like five different areas, and the and density was the overall 105 acres. Uh, and then when the 2013 master pl uh, 13 preliminary plat was proposed, I think that's when the rest of the subdivision was laid out at that time. Uh, and uh, at that time, they only proposed those 58 units. So uh, it's, as Dennis mentioned, it is about 2.2 units per that site, which is the current proposal. Uh, and I think right now it's, uh, so overall density, if we see, it's still less than what it was planned in 2001. Uh, but that's what I wanted to make note of. When we're required to make these uh, master plans, it's the snapshot of what you can imagine is going to happen based on what you know on that day. 22 years later, things have changed. Building costs have skyrocketed three, four times what they were. I mean, we can go on and on, COVID and, and all the other aspects that have come into our society in the last 22 years. This is what we feel the coming trend in housing is looking at. That's what we based it on. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is there any more just, questions? From, uh, just sure. follow up on the number of units, the definite, that probably should know this, but the definition of a unit, does the, the by units, is that one or two? One. That's one. Excuse me, excuse me, it's two. It's per lot. Per lot, okay. Because the by units are zero lot line. You own your unit and your lot. Um, 
As far as uh, touching on the questions that came up earlier, there was there was one that I wanted to seek some clarification on, if anything, to help uh, um, educate us or anybody that's interested. Um, the question specifically was about the um, soil compaction during construction and the change in permeability and how much of the um, how the calculations are done. Obviously, engineers and everybody in the know is very familiar with what that means, but maybe in layman's terms, be able to articulate um, the adequacy of, the, of that regional detention. And uh, specifically where I was going with this was, um, was how much of that calculation is based on shed versus absorption um, into the water table. And because uh, that obviously moves at a different rate. Um, when it comes to the actual rain event, obviously the same amount of rain is going to say fall on 57 houses in the same area versus 90. So I think there's some irrelevancy, irrelevancy to that. Um, but uh, but the permeability, I guess, is a is a, a question that would be worth answering. And if there's any effect on the calculation for that detention. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um... As engineers, typically when we design something, um, you don't design it for uh, the case at hand. You design it for a more conservative measure. Um, when you look at uh, calculations, when you're really anything from you know structural to water to um, you know different things that that we do, there's always a factor of safety. Um, when it comes to stormwater drainage and those calculations. Um, as engineers, we set up thresholds based on, um, in this case, it was designed based on curve number. Um, it's a mathematical system in which allows us to derive the, the existing case and compare it to a new case. In this case, um, the, the engineer was fairly conservative in their approach for what was gonna be planned. It wasn't designed specifically for 57 houses, designed for um, an expected um, lot sizing with uh, potential of houses and they were pretty conservative in it and then also included capacity to the west for the agricultural field. Um, I can defer to CJ if they like to speak about it, um, but in, in a very simplistic uh, consideration that yes, the, the soil is considered to be more compact. It's, just, it's assumed that it's no longer an agricultural field um, that has you know a, a 24 inch topsoil, a horizon soil, um, but it, it does switch uses and that, that calculation does account for that. Um, I guess I'll kind of defer it to CGA. Matt. I think that more or less answers my question, which was trying to seek clarity for, for everyone, just that, uh, that that compaction is one of the input factors in the way that's calculated. So I, I think that does yep. a fine job of answering my question. Okay, thank you. Is there any more questions for staff? I'm subject changing again. Um, so the recently adopted um, housing needs assessment, um, I know we've heard a lot about the concern for duplexes. Um, the commission has talked several times about the need for housing. Um, and so I would just be curious if there's any information in the housing needs assessment that maybe we could discuss as it relates to duplexes or this type of housing. I agree it would be maybe helpful to just see some articulation as to um, you know the developers motivations to anticipate market need versus what uh, is in the uh, needs assessment that was done. I can't imagine there'd be much difference and um, and again, I don't know how much it matters because the need for housing is so dire at the moment that, um, that anything's gonna be a good thing. Um, as far as the, the value of, of a duplex versus a single family, I wanted to touch on that for a second. Um, Karen clarified um, one thing that I feel like is important to um, note, and that's with the, um, the possible diminished value of, of a random duplex that ends up in a neighborhood and, and eventually, eventually is fated to become a rental property or something like. Um, with this newer progressive style zoning uh, using RP rather than R1 and clarifying where there'd be multifamily attached, um, 
houses versus single family. I, I think that is kind of a safeguard to where there's more of a like thing. Um, the other thing, uh, so, that, so that's good. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on with that is that uh, um, a duplex in today's dollars is likely to be a $400,000 proposition. And so if by reducing the lot cost um, on, on the built property, by combining it with another one, if that saves 10% on the cost of, uh, of a finished product, I think that's a good thing um, for the community and uh, to have mixed in with our availability in new housing. Um, but to the other point, I think it would be nice to see how what's proposed um, echoes with the needs assessment. We can certainly look at the the um, needs assessment and see if there's any information we can bring back that would be relevant to the discussion. Um. This is a question you probably can't answer, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sensitive to this because I, I think the developers trying to do, you know, they're trying to, to do something good for the community. Um, and I tend to be pro density you know, and, and developments are starting to be more dense. But there's also, I'm sensitive to the, to the people who bought their houses and are adjacent to these areas and we're told this is what's gonna happen. And now it's, it's, it's a bit different. And what is the, I don't know, maybe it's a legal question, I don't know, but what is the obligation? Or maybe it's just a, an expectation management kind of question by the developer of, of doing what they said they're going to do. Um, how do we evaluate that? Well, RP offers more assurance than R1 would an older zone, just because we get to kind of see it at face value now where there's going to be higher density and lower density rather than kind of an ad hoc approach, which you'd have the freedom to do in an R1 or R2 zone. Right. And I also think, you know, in it, you talked about expectations. You know, it's hard when, which they mentioned, you know, when you're so far out and, you know, how the world has changed. But I also think that, you know, especially related to stormwater, I think there's a big misunderstanding about what, you know, retention ponds do and detention basins and how all of that works. I think, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I have this cute pond in my neighborhood and we're going to be able to fish and walk around it. But it, it's really serving um, an engineering purpose. And I think that, you know, when you, this is just my opinion, but when you buy into a development, I think that should be very clear to the people who are a part of that HOA. And I'm afraid a lot of the times it is not. So, you know, I think if we as a body can understand those things and try to make those good choices for our citizens, you know, we do have to weigh those different issues. We need housing, we need places for people to live, we wanna grow our industrial park and bring in new people, they need places to live, but we also care about the environment and pollution and so, you know, we have to find a balance and I think that's really the purpose of zoning and of code. So hopefully, you know, I, I don't want anybody to have to be the case study, but you know, I think this is a really good example and we've heard similar issues from other developments. They're just, they already exist. So we, there's not much we can do. So hopefully we can try to make some good choices and find some compromise here with this particular issue. Well, to that, if we wanted to reduce the total water flow into the area, the, the best thing we could do is get this development done, um, make a dent in the housing crisis and annex to the west and develop that and make it controlled ground um, rather than a field that runs off. <laughs> Was that swinging for the fences? <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, any more questions for staff from commission? I have one and I have not had a chance to um, either read minutes or, or watch from the council's session on uh, green space and so i think it's been mentioned a couple of times is staff able to give any sort of insight into is council look like has providing new guidance about something a little bit more clear for developments or is there any new movement on that so i think um it is in the cip to do a new parks master plan um 
it's it's out a couple of years. I think there is a need to reevaluate that. And one of the goals of that, uh, the council discussed it at their last goal setting as well, is as part of that study for a master plan, we would like to have more clarity, maybe a more definitive um, formula put into the subdivision code that would, you know, base it on, you know, so there was a little more clear direction on the amount of open space required based on the number of units or based on the area, um, but we need some direction. Um, so right now, it's really up for the commission and the council to kind of consider whether what's being proposed is, is adequate to serve the needs of, of the development. Um, when you're talking about a uh, comprehensive plan for um, future park provision, are you talking about updating the comprehensive plan? No, there is a parks, there's a 19, I think it's 1996 parks master plan that has not been updated since that time. And so that is one of the um, um, goals of the city council to get that updated. So that becomes part of the comprehensive plan, but um, we're not talking about the comprehensive plan itself. Okay. Well, that, that would be excellent, especially if we're talking 90s when that was last done. Um, that would be a really useful tool, especially when it comes to uh, making clear metrics on what the expectations would be for future developments. Um, obviously, what was done here, I think, is, uh, is quite obviously a, a workaround, of, I think a very thoughtful workaround, but uh, um, that seemed to be a big uh, point of conversation the last time this proposal was in front of us. So it's nice to see that that, that was addressed and, and um, in an agreeable way and not just uh, swept under the rug, I guess. Speaking of the parks issue for a minute, it doesn't seem like we need a master plan to and wait two years to identify a number of acres uh, for parks per, per unit or lot or whatever that number is. Uh, that, that I just my gut, let, let, let's, I would challenge you to to think about that a bit and get something in place sooner than that because we know how you know those plans work right it's two years to be funded and that's another year to get done and we had a lot of units going in yeah there's a lot of legal aspects to determining those kinds of formulas um, so it's not as easy as it maybe sounds but uh, I can give you a number if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hire you on the spot <laughs> Could I ask for free on that then so you mentioned that I was not around when this came up last time, um, and this is a better improvement on the green space, park space than last last iteration. Well, if I recall, there there wasn't there one. Wasn't, there yeah. wasn't yeah. one at all. Is that yeah? Okay. Any more questions for staff? All right, I we will move this on to the the two uh, agenda items, the master plan and the preliminary plat uh, for Autumn Ridge. We'll move that ahead to. The next meeting for a, a voice vote to so, uh, continue that. I don't. I don't think you need that. We'll just automatically um, continue. Um, I just wanted to go over what you wanted us to bring back to you to make sure that we're clear, because okay. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion tonight. Um, there was a request to have Maria Perez come to just explain a little bit more about stormwater management, um, and we can do that. Um, also. Uh, you would ask about the housing needs assessment and if there was any guidance there. Um, was there something else that you had asked us about with regard to the stormwater calculations? There's, ah, the liability. Yeah. We can give it more there. Okay. Anything else? Did I miss anything? I think that covers it. Um, do, do we want to, are we continuing the plat? Do we want a motion um, to approve the update to the master plan? So we need just to continue both these items to the next meeting, is that, if that's? Okay, we can keep them, to, keep them okay. together. Okay. Appreciate uh, everyone coming out. Yes, appreciate everyone coming out, and uh, please come out for next meeting if you have more questions or, or more dialogue with us. We really appreciate your input on this, so thank you. And the very emails, much. too, they're very helpful. Yes, thank you for participating. Yeah, especially when those come in advance because it gives, gives staff a little bit of time to, uh, um, to research and, and come to the presentation with, uh, with better information on some of those things. So this is, this is the way it's supposed to work. Yep.
Yeah. All right. So we will uh, close those two items, move it to next week. Uh, next agenda item is any commission updates for us tonight? I don't have anything for you tonight. All right. So um, uh, any questions, comments, or a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Thank you. Meeting is closed. Thank you.